Thanks. Uh, my name's Tom Kennett. Uh, I've been working here for four years, um, two years cataloguing the correspondence of James Edward Smith, and two years writing his biography. Um, so uh, for those of you that, who don't know about Smith, um, <clears throat> he was one of the most prominent uh, botanists and natural historians of the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, uh, in large part uh, due to his purchase of Carl Linnaeus's natural history collections in 1783 um, and also his founding of this society in 1788. Um, and he also was a very prolific uh, writer. Uh, he wrote many important works, um, popular works such as English Botany and more scientific works such as Flora Botanica as well as editing John Sibthorpe's uh, Flora Grica. Um, in large part due to his, his uh, prominence, um, at the time he became the centre of a um, global network of scientific correspondence, uh, which stretched from the USA uh, via South Africa, uh, Nepal, India, all across Europe and the UK. Um, the, uh, the Linnaean Society holds the bulk of his correspondence, um, mostly the incoming correspondence, as he didn't keep copies of his own letters that he sent out. But in a few instances, there has been um, uh, a reu reunification of the ingoing and outgoing correspondence. Um, the, uh, the bulk of it is contained in 26 volumes, which were donated to the Society by Smith's widow, Pleasance, after his death. Um, and these, over in the decades, uh, since that time, they've been supplemented by uh, eight additional correspondence collections, which were either donated or purchased by the society, uh, and nine uh, manuscript collections uh, where Smith letters are part of other people's uh, manuscript collections held by the society. Um, <clears throat> It's an extremely important collection. Uh, it's uh, historically been one of the most well-used manuscript collections by, in, within the society, uh, in large part because of the wealth of information it contains. Uh, so the early years of the society itself, um, the uh, popularization of botany as a subject during this period. Um, there's a lot of discussion of new plant discoveries, uh, particularly from um, the colonies, so often correspondents would send Smith new specimens because they wanted to compare them with the Linnaean specimens uh, to identify new plants. Um, and also uh, professional connections as well. So because of his position, uh, many of the most famous uh, and important botanists and natural historians of the day corresponded directly with Smith. Um, so there's figures that you would come to expect, like Sir Joseph Banks and Robert Brown. But also, um, because this was a it's a personal man, uh, correspondence collection. There are a lot of uh, figures who aren't necessarily associated with natural history, like uh, the photography pioneer Henry Fox Talbot and uh, prison reformer Elizabeth Fry. So it's a very interesting collection uh, on many levels for scientists, for botanists, for historians, uh, for, and uh, for people interested in social history. Um, there's an awful lot going on within this collection. Um, uh, going into that a little bit more, um, Smith lived in very exciting times. He lived through the uh, French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars, um, which are frequently mentioned within the uh, correspondence, uh, but also closer to home, the uh, political strifes and uh, scandals of the period. Um, so there's two examples here. The, uh, the, the letter uh, highlighted there is, uh, was written during George III's first period of uh, insanity, um, where his correspondent reliably informed Smith that um, I understand that the string upon which he goes off is politics, particularly the German. And uh, the woman featured here is Caroline of Brunswick, who was George IV's estranged wife, uh, who caused uh, quite a lot of scandal during her short life. Um, and uh, another correspondent where they, uh, she had outraged all the decencies of which she ought to be the first example. So there's lots of very you know, unique perspectives on events in this correspondence. Um, it's always been catalogued in some form or other. Uh, Pleasant Smith's first uh, donation uh, was arranged by her, uh, heavily edited by her as well. Um, so there's many letters that we know have disappeared completely. 
because they were deemed to be of too personal a nature or contain too much sensitive family information or uh, letters that have been clipped at the bottom so they'll just stop immediately without any warning. Um, Pleasants arrange them alphabetically, um, but there's frequent mistakes uh, and for about 70 years that was the only way to access the letters was by consulting the contents page at the beginning of each volume. Um, in the 1930s, uh, Warren Dawson uh, wrote a printed catalogue uh, which became the main way to access this collection. Uh, but again, this just focused on the bound volumes presented by Pleasant Smith, um, so it didn't include the additional collections that have been gathered since uh, the first presentation of the correspondence. Um, so uh, since the collection's been with the Society, it's been continually consulted. Um, the bound volumes weren't a great way to keep the letters, so that over the decades they've become increasingly stressed. Um, and. Um, with the advent of internet uh, technologies and uh, cataloging systems, it was felt that um, this collection would really benefit from uh, like a three-part uh, approach. So to conserve the entire collection and rehouse it, to digitize it uh, so it can be accessed from anywhere in the world, and to catalog it so that, um, uh, again, it can be accessed in an efficient uh, and direct way. Um, so on to the methodology of how I went about cataloging this collection. Um, it was a uh, catalog using CARM for archives, which is uh, one of the standard uh, kind of archival description software packages, uh, and one of the most frequently used in the UK. Um, uh, so it works on a field basis. All of the fields that you can see um, down here are fully searchable. Um, so it's very um, good for accessing information uh, and all of these fields are based around uh, the ISAD-G standard, uh, the International Standard for Archival Description. Um, so it kind of it guarantees uniformity, uh, consistency and clarity. Um, uh, the catalog, the collection was catalogued to item level so uh, I individually read and described all three and a half thousand letters. Um, before I began, it was decided that certain elements would be uh, targeted and picked out in the descriptions, uh, specifically plant names, um, uh, sci other scientists, uh, publications, um, uh, medical uh, discussion, and uh, historic and social uh, events that were mentioned uh, to kind of maximize the uh, and try and cover as many bases for what people would be looking at this correspondence for. Um, <clears throat> standards were also used in the creation of uh, the name authority files. Uh, a name authority file is a kind of a, it's an index record for, um, for the people involved in this collection. So each of Smith's correspondence was given a name authority file. Uh, you can see at the top here um, different com boxes for the com composition of the names. So many of Smith's correspondence were foreign or with unusual name forms, or they were members of the, the, of the nobility, with, again, with uh, difficult name forms. So the idea with uh, this area here is that uh, all of those components would be brought together into a single standardized, authorized form of name, uh, which is really helpful for maintaining consistency across the collection, because many of these correspondence feature in other collections held by the society and within other institutions, so um, it really helps to uh, standardize the information. <clears throat> uh, so anytime uh, these correspondence, uh, th that their letters were catalogued, uh, that, that catalog record would be linked to this name authority record. Anytime those people were mentioned within the records, it would be linked again. So uh, tools like this are extremely useful for displaying um, the professional networks that existed at the time. Um, as you can imagine, from uh, having to look at so many letters at such a level of detail, uh, there are many challenges, um, not least uh, a very wide range of uh, challenging handwritings, uh, this one being an example. Um, so often there will be extremely densely packed letters uh, full of plant names, full of uh, Latin phrases, 
uh, abbreviations, contractions. Um, and because there was a finite time to do this project, um, it was often when I came across letters like this, there were about uh, 15 letters all written in this style. Um, it could really uh, threaten the overall um, progress of the project. Um, so it was a, a, a lot of time management, a lot of patience, just to be able to maintain that consistency across the catalog to extract as much from the, these letters as I was from the uh, superficially easier to understand letters. Um, <clears throat> early on, it became apparent also that there were many letters in other languages, uh, including Latin and French. Um, so uh, uh, to, to, uh, to deal with this, I uh, managed to get hold of two volunteers who very kindly translated those letters for me, which meant that um, I was able to give as full a description to those letters as to the ones that were written in English. Um, <clears throat> but going into such a level of detail was also a brilliant opportunity to really get the most out of this uh, amazing collection. Um, so the previous two kind of cataloging attempts on this collection had uh, brought in a lot of errors, so uh, misidentified correspondence, uh, incorrect dates recorded, um, uh, and uh, even within the, uh, the text itself, um, you know, there's a lot of discussion of things, you know, like the Battle of Waterloo happens within this period, but at the time it wasn't called the Battle of Waterloo, it was referred to as uh, the Great Engagement. So kind of having to identify um, what people were talking about using online tools to try and maximize uh, the, uh, the usability of this record, of, these, of this catalog. Uh, and cataloging this collection at this time now with the tools that are available to archivists and librarians um, uh, really helps bring out the most of this collection. So CARM has many uh, kind of optional fields that you can use. Uh, so there's a related records area where you can actually link records that discuss similar issues together. So there'll be a button you can click that will take you through to the, uh, to the related record. Uh, the related material field, so often there'll be discussion in these letters of, of publications or journals. Um, so I cross-referenced with the Linnaean Society Libraries catalog. So whenever a book was mentioned uh, that the society held, I was able to provide a reference for that. Um, publication notes, uh, so any time a letter had been uh, uh, transcribed and published in the past, I was able to provide a reference, which was very useful for difficult to read letters such as this one. Um, and also uh, notes on the physical description. So frequently, uh, as my colleague Andrew mentioned, these uh, letters contain spe biological specimens, uh, which wouldn't necessarily be apparent if you were just looking at a correspondence collection. So um, uh, it, helped, it helps people, uh, researchers, uh, know exactly what they're looking at. Um, so, <clears throat> the outcome of this project uh, was the, uh, the uh, interface you see here. This is the online correspondence of Sir James Edward Smith. Uh, I worked closely with Andrea um, on providing uh, work on developing metadata for the images uh, that would uh, interact with the, um, the reference numbers that were given to the letters. So uh, they're both interlinked. So uh, uh, if anything, um, there's always a constant uh, back and forth. So the letters can be uh, reunited to the descriptions if uh, anything should happen. Um, and uh, so this interface is a huge improvement on what was on the previous system. Um, it's fully searchable uh, on any field, so it can be browsed by uh, sender or date, or uh, you can click through to the more search options uh, from which you can uh, search this collection um, in any field, the most important one being the summary, which uh, equates to the description in CALM. So, because of all the plant names were recorded, uh, it's possible to, you know, if you're interested in uh, uh, digitalis, you can type in uh, digitalis in that box, and all of the letters that discuss that uh, genus will be brought up straight away. Um, 
Um, so this is how it, this is what it clicks through to. Uh, so the the letters are presented um, uh, with the images, um, and then when you click through again, you uh, you would see the image of the letter and. Uh, the, uh, the full description is contained uh, in the C4 metadata where um, all of the relevant parts from the COM catalog have been transferred across. Um, yeah, so this has been uh, a really um, fantastic project uh, both to work on uh, and uh, and uh, as a researcher and as an interested, uh, as, as someone interested in this period, um, it's really brought out the best of this collection, uh, which is now accessible anywhere in the world. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, <clears throat> the information, as Linda said, the information that came from this project uh, was so interesting. It revealed so much about Smith's life and his times that it has now resulted in. Um, in uh, his biography being written, which is now in the final stages and will hopefully be appearing soon. Uh, and that's it.